Are you praying for someone that you love to discover the wonderful gift of salvation in Jesus Christ? You know, most of us have someone that we love who doesn't yet know the Lord. I know I do. And we would do anything, anything to see them come to Jesus. Welcome to Through the Bible. Today we're engaged in a very compassionate lesson from our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, who tells us about the finest kind of evangelism, that is, prayer evangelism. We're continuing in our five-year journey through the whole Word of God, this time in Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 29. But first, let me share an amazing letter from the Bible bus. Susan from Vancouver, B.C. writes, I'm sure you hear it all the time. I wasn't looking for Jesus, but when I heard your program on the Bible, I found him anyway. That's my story. My husband's from Asia. I am from the Middle East. Together, we've tried every major religion there is, Buddhism, Islam, Rastafarianism, Scientology, and most recently, atheism. Earlier this year, someone at work gave me a cute little school bus flash drive with your program on it. I listened, and though I am just beginning to make sense of it all, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ two weeks ago. I've gone to my friend's church for the last two months, and I know that I've finally found the truth. I have no words to tell you thank you except to say that if someone out there is praying for someone they love to find Jesus, that they should just keep at it. Wow. Enough said. Let's pray. Father, we surrender to you those we love who have yet to turn to you in faith. We trust that you're working in their lives even now. Bless the word today and the saving truth that it brings to willing hearts. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we come back today to this 10th chapter of the book of Acts, the conversion of Cornelius. And we're at verse 29. We saw that Simon Peter came into the home of Cornelius and practically insulted him. He said he'd never been in the home of that which was common or unclean before. But he says God's told him not to call any man common or unclean, that they're all sinners and they're all savable. Now will you notice, I begin reading at verse 29. Therefore came I unto you, Without gain, saying, as soon as I was sent for, I ask therefore for what intent you sent for me. Now, this is what amazes me. Why would Simon Peter ask that question? I would think he'd open up the conversation immediately about the Lord Jesus. But do you notice he doesn't? This man is waiting for the leading of the Spirit, friends. He's not rushing into this. This ought to be a lesson to many of us today who are rather brusque or crude even in our witnessing. We find it difficult to witness, so we're very, generally when we do it, we do it very amateurish, and we do it abruptly, and we do it in a way that sometimes offends, and we ought not to witness like that, of course. We ought to be led of the Spirit of God. I personally believe that the finest kind of evangelism is prayer evangelism. And I mean by that, to begin praying for an individual. Then the day comes when you need to put legs on your prayer. Then ask God if you're praying for a loved one, if you're praying for a friend or a stranger you've met, ask God to lead you. And friends, I know that he'll lead you. Don't just do this on your own, because if you do it in the flesh, of course, you're going to fail. Let God be the one to lead you. Well, I wonder if I may right here repeat something I have told before, but when I was a student in college, I was very zealous to want to witness for God, but again, I was rather timid and shy about it, and I very frankly wanted to be sure I had leading. Formerly, when I was in college, I did a great deal of hitchhiking because I didn't have money to pay my bus fare or train fare. So I was out on the highway, and a man went by me in a Model A Ford, a brand new one, by the way, and he drove down, I suppose, 50 yards past me, stopped, and then he motioned for me to come. And I came rushing up with my little suitcase, and he said to me, get in. He said, I just wanted to look you over before I picked you up. He said, I don't want to pick up anyone without first looking them over. He introduced himself. He was a salesman for several of these drug concerns. And he asked me, he said, where are you going? 
I said, to Memphis. He said, well, I'm going there, and I'd be glad to take you. He said, provided you don't mind me stopping at several drugstores on the way. I'll be stopping there to get orders. So we rode along and talked about everything under the sun, and I was praying under my breath. I said, Lord, I'd like to say something to this man, but you'll have to open the door for me. I'm not going to open the door for the simple reason that he might open the door here if I mentioned anything about religion and say, what have I got in here, some religious nut, and turn me out way down on the highway somewhere where I didn't want to be turned out, and I'd have difficulty. So I very frankly said to him, just answering his questions. And so we rode along. We talked about, I think, everything under the sun. He'd stop at several drugstores on the way. At lunchtime, he asked me, was I hungry? And I was, and he bought my lunch. He said to me, I get awfully tired of driving. Do you drive? I said, yes. He said, would you like to? I said, I sure would. So I got in and started driving. And we rode along, talked about different things. He was very much relaxed. He'd mentioned this thing and that thing. Finally, we ran out of conversation. We were about 60 miles out of Memphis, riding along, and there came a lull in the conversation because, as I said, we just run out of conversation. And I was praying all the time. I said, Lord, we're getting near Memphis. There hadn't been a door open. I'm not going to open it. I don't want to be put out. I said, if you want me to witness, then you open the door for me. Well, we rode along, I guess, 10 minutes. And finally, he just spoke out of a clear sky. He says, you know, My wife and I went to church yesterday, and he laughed and looked at me and laughed, and I laughed too. And he said, you know, I don't go very often. And he said, you know, that preacher said the funniest thing. He said that Jesus was coming back to this earth again. He said, what do you think about that? Well, I told him, friends, from then on in, I told him what I thought about it, and I was able to talk to him about the first coming of Christ. And I said to him, fine, I said, the second coming of Christ means nothing to you. But I said, it's the first coming that you've got to come to Christ to accept what he did for you the first time, if you'd have any interest at all in his second coming. And this man was very frankly wide open. And he actually took me to the dormitory where I stayed at college. And he parked there, and he said, I want to see you again. And so I just blurted right out. I said, wouldn't you like to accept Christ as your Savior? He said, I sure would. Well, I said, sitting right here, you can accept him. He said, I will. And so we bowed our heads in prayer, and I prayed and asked him to pray, and he accepted Christ. May I say to you, I'll be honest with you, I would never open my mouth if the Lord hadn't somehow or another prompted him to open up a conversation. I think, friends, we need to be spirit-led. And you know, the first sermon I preached when I was ordained in Nashville, I looked down at the congregation, and there sat that man and his wife. He just sat down there smiling. Afterward, I said to him, I said, look, I'd like for you to join this church. He said, I've already joined a Baptist church over on the other part of town. And he says, it's a good church, and I'm not about to move over here with you. And he didn't. But it was wonderful, friends, to have that experience. I think that we ought to be very careful in our witnessing. That's my idea. And this man, Simon Peter, is not blurting out saying anything. He's led by the Spirit of God. He said to him, why in the world have you called for me? Why'd you send for me? Verse 30, now, and Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. At the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. Thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? In other words, Cornelius said, I don't know why I sent for you. God wants me to send for you. You must have a message. And now will you notice the message of Simon Peter? Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. What a marvelous thing that we have in the conversion of this man here. Notice now what happened. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. 
the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he's Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now you see Cornelius and those assembled are living in Caesarea, knew certain basic facts about Jesus of Nazareth, about what had been happening the past three or four years in that land. Now listen to Simon Peter, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were pressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Now notice, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Now, this man, Simon Peter, notice what he does. He presents the facts concerning Jesus Christ. He says, now, there are certain things that you already know, and they probably knew about the death of Jesus. But now he says, this is what happened that he died on the cross, and God raised him the third day and showed him openly. Now, this was the message. This is the gospel, and nothing short of that. Now, this past Christmas, I have noted that a great many have sent out Christmas cards and messages on which there is this little quotation, one solitary life. And now it's a very fine thing that's been written, no question about that. And it is very readable. But there is a strange omission there. It's a solitary omission. The most important fact is not recorded. This records the fact that he died, that Jesus died. But it doesn't even mention his resurrection. It even mentions his burial. But it's left out his resurrection. Friends, there wasn't a sermon preached in the New Testament, and especially in the book of Acts, that did not mention the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the very heart of the gospel. And until that's preached, my friend, you haven't heard the gospel. Jesus died, buried, rose again. That's a historical fact, and your relationship to it determines your eternal destiny, for he died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now listen to Simon Peter as he continues in verse 41. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. My friends, I don't criticize Simon Peter very much, as you know. I rejoice in him, and I tell his weaknesses and his faults with great joy, because he's so human, and he's so like another fellow that I know very well by the name of McGee. But the important thing is he preached the gospel, friends, and this is the gospel. Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And until you do that, you haven't done anything, friends, not for God. Notice what happened now. While Peter yet spake these words, The Holy Spirit fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that they should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Now, this has been labeled the Gentile Pentecost. Peter is astonished here that the Gentiles, too, have received the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit's been poured out upon them. It is made audible by their speaking in tongues. 
Now, this had a purpose in that day. As you can see, I think the tongues were more of an evidence to Simon Peter and the other apostles that God would save Gentiles because Simon Peter's going to come back to this in the next chapter. And he'll come back to it in the 15th chapter that this was the evidence that they had been saved. Not that they had been baptized by the Spirit, but that they had been saved. And these that were the Jews in that, they could not believe that Gentiles were going to be saved in spite of what the Lord had told them. Now the Gentiles in Cornelius' house are baptized, and that was a tremendous moving of the Spirit of God. Again, I call your attention to the fact that there are three representative conversions. The Ethiopian eunuch, Saul of Tarsus, and Cornelius. The Ethiopian eunuch is a son of Ham. Saul of Tarsus, a son of Shem. Cornelius, the Roman centurion, a son of Japheth. And the Holy Spirit moves in each case using the Word of God and the man of God. And then there came into existence a Son of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now will you notice chapter 11. And in chapter 11, we have Peter defends his ministry and the gospel goes to Antioch. And he defends his ministry to the Gentiles And that was pretty difficult for Simon Peter to do. Now, will you notice? And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. That is, there was doubting and division. And they were saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. My, that was a terrible thing to do, you see, for Simon Peter. And if you had talked to Simon Peter a month before that, he would have told you it was a terrible thing to do. But now, listen to Simon Peter. And actually, this is an apology that he gives. He makes it clear he didn't want to do this, that the Spirit of God was in it all. Verse 4, But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, Listen to him now. I was in the city of Joppa praying And in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descend as it had been, a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. And he was amazed at that. Upon the which when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts. And you see, they were forbidden to be eaten, and creeping things, and they were forbidden, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said... Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up. And the idea and the word is, all were suddenly drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. He showed us how he'd seen an angel, and so on. And notice how Simon Peter recounts the detail. Now, verse 16, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. For as much then as God gave them the like gift, as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Now, you see, the purpose of the tongues was to give evidence to Simon Peter that Gentiles had turned to God. Now, will you notice, verse 18, when they heard these things, they held their peace. Even the Judaizers had to shut their mouths. Now, they had nothing to say about this. This was obviously of God. And they glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now, this is a great day that has come, you see. The door now has been opened to the Gentiles. And we'll see shortly that the gospel will start out to the ends of the earth. Now, verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. 
And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now the Grecians, you remember, they were Greek in language and custom, but they were Hebrews. Verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things come unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Now, Antioch becomes the second center of the church. It shifts from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now, he comes up there because he finds out there's a great moving of the Spirit of God. The church in Jerusalem did. Verse 23, Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man. That's a wonderful thing to say about Barnabas. He was a good man. And there's no reason why a Christian shouldn't be a good man unless he's a woman and then should be a good woman. And full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And much people were added unto the Lord. And actually Barnabas becomes the pastor of the church there. And he saw immediately he needed an assistant pastor and he knew where to get a good one. Verse 25, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. And you detect here in the word that when he had found him, the idea is that Saul was reluctant to come. He held back. When he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And friends, I see no reason why that we should read into this something quite terrible because they're called Christians. I do not think that you have to say here it was a term of ridicule. I think they just saw these people and they said they are the followers of Christ. And since they're followers of Christ, they're Christians. They are the followers of him. And that is all right. That's a good name. And it may not have been given in derision. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. Now notice that there were prophets in the early church. Apostles and prophets are not needed today. There's some think they're prophets, but they're not. Verse 28, there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. And by the way, that's recorded in secular history. Verse 29, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Notice the fraternal spirit, the bond of love that held the early church together. The church in Jerusalem had been persecuted, decimated, hurt, and they were in need during this time of famine. And so... The other believers send help to them, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And I think Saul had been one who'd wasted the church in Jerusalem, and it's wonderful that by the same hands now he brings relief to them. This is Christianity, friends, in shoe leather, and that's where it ought to be today. We'll leave off right there and begin at chapter 12 next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. That's a great lesson. And you know, it's a picture of godly love, God using us to care for others in need. We are his hands and feet. It's like that letter that we read earlier from Susan. Susan's friend was God's hands, giving her the word of God in our little flash drive. It's the word of God that made the difference, but God used her friend to get it to her. By the way, that little flash drive really is an amazing resource. It's got the entire five-year journey through the whole word of God on it, just like you hear on the radio or on a broadcast, uh, YouTube, wherever you're listening, as well as all of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines and his digital booklets. You'll find it in the online store at ttb.org. You can also call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE to order it. 
Now, while you're at ttb.org, be sure and check out all the free resources we offer for you to share with your unsaved friends. Just click on How Can I Know God, for example, and you can send them a link to many great messages by Dr. McGee, as well as download or print several booklets. And then there's always room on the Bible bus for one more. We always say that. So be sure to invite everyone you know to hop aboard as we travel along in God's Word together. You know, there are so many options for catching the Bible bus. To see them all, you can visit ttb.org forward slash listen to find out about them all. We got another exciting study in the book of Acts coming up next time. I'm Steve Schwetz, and let's remember to keep praying. Jesus made it Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?